Welcome to the Disruptor Network Podcast. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network Podcast. We have a really good guest today, somebody who I've been following for a lot of years, Jake Thompson, who is the Chief Encouragement Officer of Compete Every Day. Compete Every Day is a brand that's been around since 2011, started as a t-shirt company out of Jake's garage. Now he's turned it into a lifestyle and he uses it to hold other people accountable across the country. Whether it's major companies or individuals, Jake inspires people to compete every single day and hold themselves accountable. He also has written a book, Compete Every Day, that's out now in stores and it's doing amazing and, and I'm getting great reviews for it and I just bought it myself. So without further ado, I'm, I'm really, really excited to talk to him, Jake Thompson. Ignition. Lift off. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network podcast. And I gave you a pretty warm intro, Jake, but uh, Jake Thompson we have here today is a great guest and I've been looking forward to talk to you for years now. We'll get into that, but welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited about the conversation, even more excited about the small world as, as we got to chat a little bit offline. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. You know, I, I, I told you a little bit about this, but um, what I didn't tell you is that your, your brand Compete Every Day, which I love. I love the whole concept behind Compete Every Day, and we'll get to that. But when I started seeing the, the clothes, you guys had real wristbands that you had that Compete Every Day on it. And I must have ordered, I don't know, 500 of them. And I had everybody within my mortgage company wearing them. And I used to give them out. I used to have a box of them in my office. And it was a really good reminder for me because I'm a competitive person. I really liked it. But I, I just love the whole concept behind it. So kudos to you. And, and I've been following you, you for longer than you've known. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. It's even more fun for me when I get to hear stories like that of, of people that not only are competitive themselves, but want to instill it in others and especially in their culture. So, uh, man, thank you for that and, and excited to just jam and hang out with you today and, and give some value to your listeners. I, I mean, and, and, you know, as I started to do some more research on um, your background, you have an amazing story, but the first thing I wanted to ask you is really where did the, the concept for Compete Every Day come from for you? Yeah, so there, it's funny you ask, uh, because it, it's, I would say, getting overhauled slightly, and, and there's a reason I say that. Uh, the story that I've talked about really for years is, is true. The part of it is I was doing consulting practice. I pursued what I thought was my dream career as a sports agent. Wasn't what I wanted after getting into it for a couple of years. Got out 2008. We remember how rough the economy was during that time frame. So I have a MBA in sports entertainment business. I have a very non-traditional work experience working on the agency side, and I couldn't get a job. And so in order to pay bills, I started freelancing. Basic graphic design, marketing strategy, social media was really new. And so teaching people how to just create content and blogs and webinars instead of just advertising all the time. And so I built that up for a couple of years and it was good money. It was good business, but I was super unfulfilled. There was just no purpose other than what's my next paycheck, not what am I doing with it? Not how am I helping others, any of that. And I started toying with this idea of what would it look like in life if we stopped settling, if we stopped giving into fear, if we stopped giving into complacency, if we stopped living to what other people's limitations were and started pushing our own, what could we actually achieve? And through this idea and, and playing with it and massaging the idea, the idea of Compete Every Day came out. And I was with two buddies on a ski trip and threw out the idea and the brand name. Both guys were like, man, that's you. Like, that is you. And so from there, that's kind of where it started. I started experimenting, like, what do I want this brand to be until eventually about eight months later, settling on t-shirts. The real kind of reason that I've just now started talking about for a number of different reasons is that when I was in college, I allowed fear to talk me out of competing. I was uncomfortable. I had a pit in my stomach. I worried that I wasn't good enough. I was so focused on the outcome and not the process. My identity was wrapped up in it and fear got a hold of me and got a hold of me good. And it, what it did is I chose to walk away from something I love. And because of that, it's one of the biggest regrets I have in life. And really what I decided when I started the company is that I wanted to help people, encourage them, motivate them. Now it's teach and equip them. How do you compete against that fear, whether it's disguised as discomfort, complacency, worry of rejection, worry of failure, like whatever that is. How do we learn to overcome that? Because we're always going to have fear. There's no getting rid of it. It's just how do you better respond to it? And so that's ultimately what started me down really finding this path and, and why I embrace the title of chief encouragement officer. It's because to encourage is simply to inspire courage. And, and what's courage? Doing something when you're scared. Not when you're not afraid, but doing something when you're afraid. And so that, that is why and how this whole thing came about. 
uh, from just a crazy idea of wanting to make an impact on some other people. So that, that's awesome. And you answered some questions. So and it, that's an amazing answer, right? And, and you actually just changed my perception of something that I was going to ask you about. And I was really like, almost surprised you because I know that your background is you, you were a very high level high school football player. Um, you got a really legitimate offer to SMU to go play there. And you decided, I don't want to go to SMU. I'm going to go to TCU and I'm going to try to walk on there. And you hurt your shoulder, I believe. Was that what it was? I your shoulder, your, yeah, yeah I, I hurt my shoulder going into my freshman year. Yeah, and, and and so you decided to stop playing um, and you kind of, as I heard, just you, I've heard some, you speak of some, you fought the urge to go back a few times. And when I saw that, um, the first thing I thought of is, is how did you fight the urge to go back? First of all, and I found it to be a really mature choice, right? Like I don't want to be injured for the rest of my life. And it was not tell me it was something it was, different. It, 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 it was fear. Different. It was, it was pure fear. Uh, so I, I did. The doctors gave me the option, go have surgery. And at your size, I'm five eleven Now I was like a buck 55 coming out of high school as a quarterback. Not, not your ideal size. And they're like, you're going to have multiple surgeries or just, Let's try this protocol. Let's do some injections. Let's do rehab, go to school and enjoy it. And so that was the route I initially went. And I lived in the football dorms my freshman year and guys would come out. I'd go play intramurals because I wasn't getting hit on it. And my roommate and other guys on the team were like, you need to come out and play. And so I was like, screw it. Spring semester, let's go. And so I showed up second week of spring semester. My class schedule was all different. And so I was having to train alone. In that first week, and it was awful uh, because I was the freshman in the varsity locker room feeling, and I couldn't throw with anybody. I couldn't learn playbooks. It was like, just go work out by yourself. And I had that pit in my stomach, I don't belong here, imposter syndrome feeling that we all know stepping into a new environment. At, at 38, I know exactly what was going on in my head. I know why I was feeling this way. I know everything. At 19, emotionally immature, I feel like my gut's telling me this is wrong. Like everybody's like, listen to your gut. Like my gut's telling me this is wrong. Like I don't belong here. What if I fail? What if I don't have what it takes? And I remember finishing that first week of training. And I remember like looking in the mirror and having this pit in my stomach and hating it, hating that feeling of not feeling like I belong. And I remember hating my reflection for feeling that way. Like this is what I thought my dream was. And my gut, my body is telling me in this moment, like, this is wrong. And all it was, was fear saying, you've never done this before, like grow into it. Yeah. But I didn't see it that way at that time. And I walked away. I walked away after that. I was like this, I, I just can't do it. And it was literally for the next, uh, not even lying, the next 10 years, that decision haunted me because I could watch other guys play. I could go out and do intramurals. I could go th throw the football with guys. And the players that were on the field would be like, you can come play. Like you need to come out and play. And I just suppressed that and pushed that down of like, ah, my arm's not going to handle it. But all the while it was fear. And it was me being emotionally a weak, mentally weak. It was me not understanding the aspects of a growth mindset. It was the fixed mindset of being really wrapped up of what if I try my hardest, do my best, go after this and I fail. What does that say about who I am as a person? And so I did what most of us do is we avoid the challenge. We avoid the opportunity to compete. We avoid the chance to fail, believing that's safer. In the big picture, that's the most dangerous move we can ever make. Ronnie Ware talks about it in her blog post, The Five Regrets of the Dying. The number one regret of people on their deathbed is I wish I'd had the courage to go after the life I wanted instead of settling for what other people wanted for me. We let fear talk us out of going after and taking shots and betting on ourselves, And that always is a heavier burden. Regret is always a heavier burden than failure. And yeah. so at 19, so strong. Yeah, it's I was strong. still highly competitive. Like, I mean, mad, like I laugh, like if you beat me in Madden, I'm going to play a hundred times. So I'll beat you. Like I still took the competitive side, but in an aspect of what I love, like fear talked me out of it. And I didn't tell that story. Literally have just now told that story. It's December, what, 21st, 20th. Just started telling that story in the last month because I was at an event and I'm going back and forth with this guy about um, belief system and, and how do we work it? And he's doing an incredible job with his workshop. And it hits me in the back of my head, like you need to tell this story because you're allowing fear to tell you, if you tell this, people are gonna think you're a fraud. If you're all about competing and you walked away from it, 
you're not going to, you know, nobody's going to believe you. Nobody's going to buy into your brand. And what I had to realize and what it took years to realize is I own my story, but my biggest failure is what led me down this path to making sure others don't make that same that's mistake. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's so awesome, dude. And in so many different ways, that's awesome. And um, so I think a couple of things. So I always talk about growth trap, right? And uh, I think the growth trap is we get a point in life where we have to force growth. And we don't know how to we don't know how to do it. So a lot of people just don't do it. Like you know, when, when you're a kid, by the time you were 18, you were probably grown pretty natural. You were a natural athlete. You could do some things really, really well, and you didn't have to force any growth. We get to a point where we have to force growth, and some of us don't know how to do it. And it, it, until we learn how to do it, we can't really truly succeed, I believe. But I think the most powerful thing you're saying is that that failure is so powerful, and it makes me almost resonate more with your brand than less because it's like you realize that it was that you were afraid of it and you were f- fearful of it. And I think that's. And, and let me ask you a question because this happens to me a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit older than you, but do you start to look back on things and like that and it becomes clearer to you what the real reasoning was? Did it take you a long time to come to that realization that it was fear? Like, Yeah, it, it did. It took yeah. me years of trying to understand because I, so I grew up only child, small town, East Texas, super conservative town, conservative parents you know, trying to fit in all of, you know, you're just trying to be accepted as a kid. You're trying to make friends. You want to be popular. You want to be good at sports. You're not really thinking about the self-awareness piece, the, the grit, all of that. You're just like, work hard, go to school, whatever. And I remember, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, re- starting to read stuff and really diving into leadership, sports psychology, personal development. And I'd always read that stuff, but really studying it now, not just reading it, but studying it. And just little memories would pop up of like, oh, I remember this. Like Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, like that whole book was just like, because I'm reading it. I'm like, well, that's why I did that in relationships. Oh, now I know why I wanted to avoid certain classes in school. Now I know why I was so worried about making a, a C and what that would say about me and why I would get that pit in my stomach. And now, oh, now I know why I would do this. And, and once I realized that, it really shifted how I could reframe and talk to myself about situations now, because I know when I get that pit in my stomach and that uncomfortable feeling, I have to go through questions. Why am I feeling this? Am I, is it really, am I really afraid? Am I really in danger? Am I just worried what somebody else is going to say? What's the biggest concern? And, and so it's completely changed my reality, but man, every one of us, that's the point of growth. Like we should be able to look back now and be like, oh, that's why I did that which now creates a great teaching opportunity for others of like, listen, I've been there. Here's what I did. Here's where I messed up. Here's what I want you to avoid. But we don't do that unless one, we take the time to reflect and look back instead of live there. And two, we're doing the work continually now to just grow and develop. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Do you feel like, um, some of the things that you had from there, like what made you such a good football player or a good student? Cause you were a very good student too. Do you think the principles of that, um, transfer over to your company later on and transfer into life that you continue because even becoming a freelance yeah. graphic designer which you had no background then you, you you decided to take that as a job like do, do some of the principles paid off paid off right like some of those like those yeah consistency it's things. you don't but you don't know until like you're there like looking back yeah teaching myself graphic design and basic web design was a game changer when i was starting this but at the time i was just trying to do it for that role i was trying to figure out a way to, to stand out when i was with the agency Football wise, like I knew from the young age, like I was never going to be the most talented guy. And the one thing that drove me is like, I had some insanely talented teammates and a couple of guys got to play college ball. Uh, None of them made it onto the NFL uh, in my class or the class right above me, but we had some kids that were like unworldly talent that didn't even make the next level because they were so inconsistent with their training. Like they just, they didn't care. They didn't really want to practice. They didn't want to go. And I remember like that drove me crazy as an athlete growing up because I'm like, I would give anything for your size, speed and skill. Like I would, that was what I wanted in my body. And so it taught me the importance of just because someone's more talented than you doesn't mean they're going to be more successful than you. And you've got to be willing to outwork folks. And so that mentality of like almost to a fault at times, like I'm going to outwork you and I'm going to outlast you. And it's going to be a matter of who's hanging on at the end that stuck with me all throughout um, for sure. And then, you know, one of the other things that I, I talked about in the book is when I got hit in the face in like first grade with a baseball, like 
I was done. Like I was going from hitting a hundred percent every time on the pitching machine and coach pitch to like, not even want to standing the box against a machine because I had those flashbacks of that ball hit me in the face and I was getting ready to quit. My dad was like, once you start, you don't quit. And he said, if you start a season, you stick with it. And like part of that mentality really stuck with me early on in building the business of like, when you're afraid, when it sucks, when you don't know what you're doing, like figure it out and just go that way. And I think a lot of times we avoid those situations. Now we avoid putting ourselves in a spot where we don't know it all where we might mess it up, but like, it's only going through that, that we get into that growth set because once we get to a certain level, complacency sets in, we do it. We think we've done it this way. We think, you know, we're always going to do it this way. And what we fail to see is once you get to this level, the climb starts again to the next one. Yep. So you just got to lean down to that discomfort and keep going. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really, really true. I think that somebody like you who likes competition and feeds off that, and I have this problem sometimes too, where I don't um, really celebrate wins and I'm always kind of oh, yeah. looking at what's next. And, and I, I think that it's mostly healthy, but it could, it could be, you know, it could be unhealthy too, that you're just kind of always looking for the next step. But you're right. I'm always, I think that I'm afraid of complacency. You know, you saying that maybe think about that, you know, it, does, how do you talk to people about avoiding that? Like getting to a certain Man. place and just becoming complacent. That's hard. I, and I think that's, that's hard for all of us. It is a trap that anytime you succeed or start to get progress, that's what happens. I mean, we see it right now. We're going to see it in January. There's so many people that are going to come out of the gate after a goal and they're not going to come out hundred miles an hour, like a lot of folks, but they're going to come out strong and they're not going to track their progress. And about two to three months in, they're going to feel like they're getting nowhere and they're going to check out. Or you're going to see the people that are going to start to get results, man, they, they got on their diet, they got working out, they're starting to lose that weight. And then they're going to completely take their foot off the gas because they're starting to make a little progress. And so for us, it's a balance. What we have to do is twofold. We've got to one track everything. Like we need to know, like if you're going to the gym, like you need to track what you lift and what you put on a bar and how many reps you do. Yeah. Because what's going to happen is six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, you're going to hear something whisper in the back of your ear that you didn't, you're not getting stronger. You're not getting better because maybe you see somebody on social media, you see somebody else at the gym, you start to compare yourself. And if you don't have something to go back and look at and be like, no, this is actually how far I've come, which should then motivate you to see how much more do I still have in the tank? How much more can I keep going? So the tracking piece is big. The second is just this humble curiosity to say, what can I do a little bit better? Like you look at the best in any sport, look at Jordan, you look at Brady, Kobe, like these guys, like even at the top of their game, we're still like, there's gotta be like one thing I can do better. Like what's one thing. So it's, it's that mentality of like, be grateful for what you've done, be proud of the progress you made. But at the same time, as long as you're still breathing, let's see what else you got. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's And I would assume that in your business and that mentality, like, and, you know, getting into the apparel space and, 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 you know, you know, I'm sure you think back on it now, like, what the hell was I thinking? Cause I'm sure getting in, oh, you, you are like, <laughs> it seemed easy, but I mean, that's a challenging oh. space you're doing. And I, and listen to in your story that you had that kind of massive growth and you got to the point, like I think 13 or 14, which you had taken on a lot of debt and you were really like living in hell with your company where you were having a lot of issues. Um, how did you push through that and not quit at that time and say, look, I'm just going to go do something else. I have this degree. I have this background. I'll go find a job at sports or whatever. Like, how did you not quit during that time period? So we, we've got a lot of business leaders. We've got owners listening to this show. And one of the biggest mistakes I made starting is, is I had the idea, knew what I wanted to do. And then I just started looking at what everybody else is doing and trying to think I needed to be like them. I thought I needed to take on all this debt so that we could look bigger than we were instead of focusing on improving our systems, our brand, things like that. And so there was a lot of zigging and zagging in those early years from a messaging standpoint to a focus standpoint, because I didn't know what I was doing. And I'm just trying to figure out what's going to work versus like, what is the core mission? Dive down, just everything. If If it doesn't fit this, it's a no. And so when we started getting in that hole, 2015, we really started looking at as a team of what do we do differently? Like what separates us and everything? It was the message. There's some awesome apparel companies out there. There's some incredibly big name people running some of them. There's some that you have no idea who their team is. There's great niches. Like there's all of that. We need to stop trying to be for everybody. Just because everyone can compete doesn't mean everybody will. 
So we need to one dial in on who are the people that just want to be great, go find them and help them be great. The second thing we have to do is, is look at what's our advantage as our brand message and start thinking beyond just apparel. And that's really when my team was pushing me at the time about speaking book, like look at how you can really tell this message better than just on a printed shirt. The shirt can empower somebody. It can motivate somebody. It can make you feel good going into the gym, but really change and getting people bought in. That's that lifestyle, that mindset piece. And so for us, it, I just started exploring, like, what would it look like to start learning how to teach people and speak on stage or, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And so we started shifting the business and I've told people this before, but like 15, 14, 15, 16, like sales are, we're just climbing. We're, I'm taking on debt to handle inventory because I'm, I'm kind of funding this myself. We had no investors, like we're growing. But at the same time, like I can see one, two, three years from now, the way we're built, it's not going to work. Like we're, we're doing a ton of events. We did race marathons, CrossFit events, the Arnold, like we did all these offline events that I didn't want to continue doing myself. And we needed to start shifting our model. So 17, we went all in on the offline space, all in on events, trying to build the whole cell network. And then 18, I was like, we're focused digital. Like we're going digital and I'm, I'm going to go chase this speaking thing that I think can work. And 18 about sunk us. Um, and it was that moment that every business owner has when just all hell breaks loose and you just grip and say, what are we here to do and how can we do it better? And you just take it one day at a time. And, and that was every morning. It was like, I'm stressed. There's so much on my plate. Um, I don't know if we're going to get through this, but what's the one thing I'm going to do today to put us in a better position tomorrow? And we just day by day chipped away at it. And 18, you start getting a lot of momentum on the speaking side. 19, I start getting a lot of paid opportunities to go speak. I lost some because I didn't have a book yet. Clients were like, hey, we love you, but so-and-so is a better fit because they have a book. So cool, I'll see you next year. Competitive side, kick it <laughs> yeah. back in. Wrote the book, book dropped in 2020. 2020 looked great, COVID hits. We have to pivot, do a ton of virtual, ton of new programs, but it was the right move. Like it was 100% the right move of shifting from strictly e-com to now a brand, an actual brand, training and development. We still have apparel, we still have all these other pieces. But when you're going through the storm, you question yourself, you're burning a candle at both ends. The only way to get through it is to say, what do I need to do today to get in a better position tomorrow? And it literally is just repeating it. It sounds basic, but the basics work. It sounds, yeah. you know, almost too simple and in every situation is different, but at the end of the day, it's not. What do you do well? How can you do more of it? How can you serve more of those people? What's in my control this role? You know, I, I had this, man, just what you said there, I had this conversation with my managers yesterday and today. It's like, focus on what you can control. Like, stop worrying about all this stuff that's out of your control. Just focus on what you control. So I think that that's genius in trying to make your business do it. Now, and how did you, um, now from 18 to now, how did you make, did re, you kind of reformed the whole concept, right? And yeah. how do you make it more scalable now where we're going to educate too? And that's going to be a big portion of our business. Yeah. And, and because that was new, right? Like you weren't speaking in front of crowds before no. you just started doing that. So like, you know, what is, and I think that, um, you know, people with substance need to speak and you have a lot of substance, right? So, but how did you get yourself ready to be, to be that person in front of a crowd? Yeah. So a couple of things do one thing at a time. So the first thing was the speaking, then it was the book. Actually, I take that back. It was the podcast, then the speaking, then the book. Now we've got coaching and some other pieces kind of coming down the line. The first thing I did, and, and I knew it from the get-go, was hire someone who knows what they're doing with it and learn from them. And so when I started to get speaking opportunities, um, I was just, I started trying to figure out who online was teaching this, who I could learn from. And I went and saw a guy named Michael Port. He runs an incredible program called Heroic Public Speaking out of Philly or outside of Philadelphia area, New Jersey area. And I went to their conference and as I'm sitting at a table, October of 16, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing like some New York times bestsellers and some big online influencers in there. And they're taking notes like crazy. And my first thought is, boom, if these guys are taking notes and learning, like this is for real, this is not snake oil. So I'm in. And they did a, and they do a program. It was like four months, four or five days of time in Philly. It was a significant investment. Uh, but I decided if this is really where I feel we can make the most impact, we're going in. And so I joined the program, went through and got coached, learned how to handle the performance side of storytelling and working the stage. 
And then as soon as I finished, I went and hired a buddy of mine who teaches the business side of speaking for people who want to get into it. So getting coaches and learning from coaches were all in. And then having mentors that I could just talk to, ask questions to. It wasn't, hey, can I pick your brain over coffee? It was, hey, here's two or three specific questions. How did you handle them when you were at my stage in your career? How do you handle them now? And that was a huge piece. And so focusing on those one at a time, instead of we can do everything, we just can't do everything all at once. You got to pick something and start to stage it. And so now this year, you know, we've done that, the speaking, all that. So this year it's focusing more on training and development. So we've got coaching and development programs that I'm doing with some of my clients I already spoke at of how do we, you know, when I go do a a 60 to 90 minute keynote, it's, it's kind of the what, but people really want to dive into the how, and you can't really do that in a one session. So we, okay, how do we extend the life of the how? So we're working on that. We're working on creating some online courses for uh, our, all of our customer base in January, um, as well as kind of a daily membership program that I'm super excited about because I can scale it. Um, but it takes a lot of the stuff we're doing. It puts it into bite-sized daily pieces of content that our members can get. Uh, and allows me to continue thinking of new ways to teach content, seeing what resonates with people, and then doubling down on it. Yeah, that's what, and I think that what gives you even more credibility is you really built your brand up before social media was was hugely popular, and and I think it's it's become a little bit easier to get your brand out there than it was now. But I think you were even bef- before that you were out there pushing your brand, and I and I saw places that I wouldn't normally see. So I, I give you a lot of credit for that. And um, I did, and I want to tell you something else too. Just hearing you speak and looking at the brand and all that stuff, I bought the book now. I bought it yesterday after I did some research on you. I just started reading it. I bought the audio, but uh, and I, and and I got through a couple of chapters, but I bought it because there was a lot of substance in you, and so I wanted it made me want to read the book. So I think that. Um, you've laid a foundation, which kind of leads me to want more, right? Like, and I, I, and I think that's great. So, so, so I congratulate you on that Thank more you. than anything. Um, when you, you know, and a little bit more about your background, I know that you come from an entrepreneurial yeah. family, right? Like your dad owned gas stations, I believe. Oh it, yeah. My, it, uh, <laughs> my grandfather was a contractor, had his own contracting business. He kind of uh, built and built up here in Dallas by himself. My other grandfather was a, a cotton farmer in West Texas, um, so my family, like from the roots have been like, eat what you kill. And yeah. <laughs> my dad had a small chain of gas stations in East Texas. He started his first one a little, like right when I was born and built him up. So when I was six, seven, eight years old, like that's where you are. You're working in the stores, you're cleaning the gas pumps, you're sweeping the parking lots. So I got a really cool look at entrepreneurship up close. I got to see how he treated his team. I got to see how he would jump in and lead by example. And you also get to see the bad side. I mean, he had a secretary that embezzled, stole a couple hundred thousand from him. And as a small business owner, like that nearly breaks you. And so you just, you get to see all aspects of it up close and you kind of decide, do I, do I want this? Do I want some of the roller coaster or not? And, And ultimately for me, realizing My dad was at every one of my T-ball, baseball, football games. Like they never, he never missed a practice. Like he had that flexibility, even in the midst of chaos that I was like, one day, that's what I want. I want to be able to say I'm at my kid's soccer practice when I have kids one day. I want to say I'm at every recital, whatever that is. And so I'm like, let's do it. And, and and I kind of took on the mentality similar to he did similar, you know, you have as well. Like if it's meant to be, it's up to me. Like there's going to be lucky breaks. There's going to be things outside of my control. There's going to be heartbreak and, and it's celebrations. But at the end of the day, like I want to see what I can do and I'm going to bet on me instead of hoping and waiting on someone else to. Yeah. It's great that you grew up that way and you kind of got the, the real view of it. And I think that it probably prepared you for everything you've been through now too. Like, like it was a little bit of a training camp, which, which I think is awesome. So where do you see, like, where do you see the brand going now, right? Like, what do you see over the next couple of years? Where do you see your brand going? Where do you think you want it to be in, in you know, in 2022 and 2023? Yeah, so I, obviously a household name is the goal uh, because I believe that every one of us have the opportunity to compete. I think for some of us, we just need to understand what fear is disguising itself to us as, complacency, discomfort, you name it. And we need to understand there's actually tools and and things we can do mentally and within our environment, our relationships to overcome it. And so where I'm putting all my emphasis right now, all of my focus is on speaking, my speaking uh, program and coaching clients, and then getting the next book done. Goal is to crank one out about every 24 months. 
and then really just continue to scale our e-com business and put a team in place. We've got some people already there, but continue to grow and build that team in place to where it almost runs as its own business outside of me. So while I'm focused solely on speaking, coaching, and building the brand in that arena, and then we have the e-com group that continues to grow it because it's, it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship in terms of you can pick up a shirt or a wristband and that message is going to remind you of what you're capable of. It's going to empower you. It's going to help get that message in your head at a very easy spot, or you're going to grab the book and you're going to dive a little bit deeper. Or you're going to see me speak at an event or to your company. And we're going to be able to take those concepts to a new level, which then you turn around and look at that shirt in a little bit different light now, because now you've got more context around some of those messages. And so Man, that's kind of where we're going. Just continue to grow and make an impact is where I want to be because I feel like the better people start showing up, especially in today's society, we have a lot of people that don't want to do the work. Um, we have a lot of people that that want their victories easier handed to them and, and they're missing what history really says in that we need a purpose and we need to struggle. And we need people who are willing to take on those struggles and purposes and overcome them, whether it's starting a business, which... I'm all for small businesses and entrepreneurship because I'm like, you're giving other people an opportunity to have a job, to support their family, to add to the community, take on that challenge. We need people that are willing to step up and, and help with youth and youth athletes and things like that. And so the better I can equip people, whether it's shirts, books, you name it, the better, hopefully that ripple effect can be on who they impact and what they go do. Yeah. And, so, and you, know, you said something uh, in, in your backstory too, that made me think I have, my son's eight, my daughter's six now, and he's put, starting to play sports and I, I have flexibility and schedule. I can be at all, all the practices and the games, but I, my father wasn't that way. He had like three jobs and he just, he, you know, he worked for somebody else. So he wasn't able to do the same. And I said to him recently, he had like a, a day where he had baseball and basketball on the same day. And by the second game, he just, he was tired and the effort wasn't there. And, and I said, I just want you to give effort. I was like, you know, who came to all my games and practices? And he was like, who? I was like, nobody, because they had, they were working. Right. But I struggle with this because, and, I, and you're a great person to ask, am I setting him up for failure by being there all the time? Or am I, am, is it better to know that you have security bank that he doesn't have to do it on his own? Like, so I, you're yeah. a good person to ask that. So, oh, I, so, so, okay. So there's, <laughs> there's an awesome, awesome, uh, just study on this right now. And there's a really cool book called Nurture Shock. It's okay. by Ashley Merriman and Pope Bronson. They also wrote the book Top Dog, which is like a scientific study of winning and losing. Fascinating reads. But they talk heavily about like involvement. And you talk to a lot of people in the sports psych space and coaching space. It's better for you to be there. The key is the car ride home and the conversations we have. And I say that because it's really easy for us to talk about the points scored, the hits made, uh, you know, how well did your team win? Did your team lose? And what happens in youth, especially, and we actually see this in corporate culture as well, when we become heavy outcome focused from communication and emphasis is they lose the importance of the process. And especially in youth, they start to equate points scored wins with mom and dad's affection and love. The reality is the conversations around, I saw how hard you hustled. I love how hard you practice. I'm proud of how you, when you got pulled off the court that you still were cheering on your teammates. I love how you picked up that teammate who missed that shot. Like the skills that we want them to realize are important and ultimately make them most successful in life. Being a great teammate, being a leader, handling adversity, working your tail off. Like those are the things we emphasize. And so studies show the biggest reason kids quit sports before the end of high school is the car ride home. And a lot of times it's because the car ride home is about, do you win, do you lose, how many points you get, the coach sucks, blah, 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 blah. It's all of these outcome focus versus I'm proud of how hard you did this. How do you think you did today in terms of your effort? Like asking questions in, in that area. And so you being there, 100% for them to have the support, there's, there's no safety for them because you're not going on the court or on the field to play That's for true. them. But knowing that somebody's there and going to have their back regardless of what that scoreboard says at the end is huge. Then you get to ask them the questions. Did you play your hardest? Why did you handle that way? What do you think? And so you, it gives you more opportunities. What I'll say is as a parent, it gives you more opportunities to set them up for success with the skills and the traits that they're going to need, regardless of whether they ever play another sport again after high school or not. But it's only by being there, being able to ask questions and focusing on the process that you set them up to succeed that way. That's awesome. And thank you for that. That's a really, really good yeah. answer. And um, 
the car ride home is a, a long conversation. So, yeah, so I, I think that's, that's really good advice, actually. So thank you. Um, you bet. So just like a, a couple of quick things now. So one, you mentioned a few books. Um, what's a book that you would recommend? Like what's one of your favorite books or something you feel like has really shaped your mindset today? What's, what's a book you could recommend? Uh, so Mindset by Carol Dweck is a game changer. Um, absolutely is because it looks at fixed versus growth mindset. And you can really, I would say, reevaluate how you did certain things, how you see certain things, how you handle fear, discomfort, all of that. And I think that one's a huge one. Um, I really love the book Resilience by Eric Greetens, former Navy SEAL. He's writing it to a fellow soldier that he served with that's battling alcoholism, depression, and divorce. And it's just a series of letters about resilience and how we build resilience. Phenomenal read. Um, man, my book's full. Atomic Habits is a huge Atomic one as well. Habits, I can't help but, uh, but recommend. Uh, and then Greg McCowan uh, has two great ones called Essentialism and Effortless. And those are really good about evaluating what are we doing, especially as business owners and, and leaders, like we put so much on our plate. Is what we're doing actually helping us get to where we want to go? How much of it is just busy work and fluff? And how can we better optimize what we work on to get the results we want instead of trying to do everything, think we have to do everything, when in reality, we don't? That's great. That's, that's, I, I, and I've read a couple of those books, and those are really, really good recommendations. Um, if you could tell yourself one thing, your 18-year-old self one thing today, uh, and I know that you've said you've kind of talked on a little yeah. bit of it, but what, what would that be? Uh, I would t actually I'd tell them two things, two of the biggest things I wish I knew at, at 16, 17, 18, always chase progress instead of popularity. Popularity will fade. Progress is what lasts. And second, that pit in your stomach, that feeling of discomfort, all it is, is fear trying to tell you you've never done something before. And the only way to get it to go away is to actually take action toward it. That's good. That's really good. What's one thing that frustrates you uh, about other people around you in your circle that, that you're trying to help? Ooh, so I'm, I'm pretty intentional with my circle. Um, and so I don't really tolerate a lot of the things that would frustrate me um, at all. But I can tell you with past individuals that I don't spend as much time with now, it's the idea of waiting for something to change versus being someone who goes and makes change. And it's it, regardless of what's happening, it doesn't matter what the government's doing. It doesn't matter what your neighbor down the street's doing. Like we still control our attitude, actions, effort, and where we focus. And so if we want to see change, what are we doing to create that change? We might not be able to change everything, but what are we doing to change our life, our home, our family, our situation? And if we aren't continuing to talk about it is just making us feel good without ever changing the situation. That's really good. That, and and that, I think that's important in, in growth. That's so important that, we, that, we, that we're, we're forcing change and not just waiting for it to happen. So that's awesome. What's one goal you have for 2022? Ooh, biggest goal I have for 2022 is to get on 55 stages. So I am focused on it, working on it. That is where I want to get from a, a career standpoint uh, and super excited for it. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, and, and listen, I would come to see you speak. So, so I'll, I'm going to look out for the schedule. And if people want to get connect, it done, if people want to connect with you, where where is the best place to reach you? Easy, easiest place is competeeveryday.com. We put everything there as a hub. There's links out to my speaker website, to the podcast, to apparel, all of that kind of stuff. So join it there. If you're on social media, compete every day on any social network. Um, I'm behind the scenes on that. So if you say hi on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'll be sure to shoot you a DM back and say hi. And, and obviously anything that we talked about here on the show, if you have questions and if you want to jam further on, shoot me a note. would love to continue the conversation. Oh, you're awesome, man. And I, and I really appreciate you, you being candid. And a lot of what you're going through, um, I've either gone through, or I'm going through this time. So a lot of what you're saying resonates with me. And even in your book, what, what I've read so far, it's been, it's been amazing. So I, I recommend everybody listen to, 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 to the audio book or read the book. I'm more of an audio guy, but, um, and check for Jake speaking and definitely check out compete every day, but I really appreciate you coming on today. And, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more from you in the future. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot, Jake. What an amazing podcast that was with Jake. I, I know I took a ton from it. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff he spoke to really spoke to me as far as the, the battle of entrepreneurship and just your growth through that and the obstacles we face and how we have to push through that. And even his backstory, how he had to kind of pivot away from some other things and really believe in himself to get to another level. So I hope it resonated with you. Uh, this is 
uh, a great podcast for you. It'll be our last podcast of the, the 2021 year. Uh, so I, I thank everybody for supporting us this year and checking out the Disruptors Network and check out all our other episodes on all of your podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, Anchor, uh, we're, we're everywhere. And we're going to have some great guests in 2022. And, and I really hope to see you guys uh, have a happy new year. And thanks again for the support. 